Right, uh, welcome to the online causal inference seminar. Today, we're very excited to have Razia Nabi. We'll talk about semi-parametric inference for causal effects in graphical models with uh, hidden variables. We also have a collaborator in chat today, uh, Rohit. And uh, so please uh, post all the questions uh, that you have. Um, after the talk, we'll have a discussion by Eric chetkin chetkin And after that, if we have time left, we'll take some more questions. Uh, questions today will be handled by Michael. So I'm quickly switching over to him now. Uh, thanks, Dominic. So as Dominic said, we're very lucky to have Rohit Bhattacharya helping us with, uh, with questions today. So please uh, submit your questions through uh, the Q&A box. So that's the Q&A box and not the, the chat. Um, also, uh, Razier will, will pause uh, once or twice to uh, receive questions live. Uh, and so uh, I may ask you to uh, unmute yourself if you'd like to ask your question live. And uh, just keep in mind that the Talk is being recorded if if you if you choose to do that. Uh, so with that, uh, we can move to Razia. Please start whenever you're ready. All right. So is this clear? Yes, it was great. Okay. Uh, great. <clears throat> Uh, first of all, uh, thank you very much for organizing this wonderful seminar series, um, and thanks for having me. I'm very honored. The topic of uh, my talk is on identification and estimation of causal effects in graphical models with unmeasured confounders. So I graduated from Hopkins about a week ago, and tomorrow is actually their graduation hooding ceremony, and in about a month, I'll be joining uh, the faculty at the Biostats Department at Emory University. And this is a joint work with uh, Rohit Patacharya, who is an equal contributor with me on this work and is joining the faculty at Williams College, and uh, Elia Schwitzer from Hopkins. So in this work, we are interested in causal effect of a single treatment on a single outcome uh, that is encoded by a counterfactual contrast of the form Y parentheses T, which reads as the potential outcome Y when treatment T is assigned to value little t. And we set our target of interest to be the counterfactual mean and denoted, denoted it by uh, psi T. And we, we want to explore different estimation strategies for uh, this parameter when it is identified, meaning that we can write it down as a function of observed data in a model with with unmeasured uh, or unobserved confounders. So to generate causal inferences, we need a model that encodes our assumptions on how counterfactuals and factuals uh, are related. And in this work, we are using causal graphical models with hidden or latent variables to represent the model. Um, of course, causal um, graphs are very powerful tools and they've been uh, useful in driving many novel results in the field. And also they are very useful in communicating our assumptions about uh, part of our assumption about the data generating process to um, folks and researchers of, uh, in different disciplines. And in this work, we are considering uh, non-parametric identification of uh, the target, in, meaning that the identification of psi t uh, will not rely on any parametric or semi-parametric assumption on the underlying distribution. And we want to derive estimators for this identified uh, target uh, that have desirable statistical properties like uh, fast rates of convergence, normal limiting distributions, and um, robustness to model misclassification and efficient estimators that, uh, um, that, uh, that come with nice quantification of uncertainty, basically. So just a quick overview of uh, causal graphical models. A simple form of a causal graph is a directed acyclic graph that is a collection of vertices that represent random variables and uh, directed edges with no direct cycle, uh, where direct edge basically implies direct cause. And this is the simplest uh, graph that we can draw in causal inference on three variables, the treatment, the outcome, and a bunch of confounders. And we can think of uh, a causal model of a DAG as a system of non-parametric structural equation uh, where we basically say that each variable is a function of uh, their parents, which are uh, the ones that are pro directly pointing to the variable and some error terms where errors are mutually independent. Uh, but uh, this doesn't have to be the case. And what we discuss is going to also work in a less restrictive causal model. And uh, the causal uh, model plus the, the intervention operation gives us the independencies between uh, the factuals and the counterfactuals. For example, in this graph, uh, we have uh, what's known as the exchangeability or the conditional ignorability assumption that uh, tells us that counterfactual is going to be independent of the treatment given the confounder C. 
We can also have the counterfactual show up on the graph by constructing what's known as the single word intervention graph uh, or SWIG for short, where we are dividing, where we are splitting the treatment basically into two parts, uh, the random part that takes all the incoming edges and the fixed part that takes all the outgoing edges. And uh, the variables downstream the treatment will turn into a counterfactual. And this uh, exchangeability plus some uh, other standard assumptions like consistency and positivity uh, gives us, enables us to basically write down the target, the counterfactual mean as a function of observed data via this iterative expectation that uh, is called the adjustment functional. And there are various ways of estimating this, um, this quantity, basically like the plug-in estimators, the matching, the inverse probability weighting, influence function-based estimators like augmented IPW, TMLE, and, and et cetera. Um, so in general, we know a lot about DAGs, for example, the statistical model of a DAG over a set of vertices or uh, random variables V uh, is a set of distributions that fact can be factorized as uh, such. It's a product over conditional distribution of each variable given uh, the parents on the graph. And this statistical model basically encode a set of conditional independencies uh, that are implied by this set here that is um, sometimes referred to as the local markup property index, uh, which says that each variable is going to be independent of their non-descendant and non-parents given the parents of uh, the vertices or the variable on the graph. In general, we can read of um, independencies between uh, two random variables via uh, what's known as deseparation, where we basically say that um, if um, given a third variable, two variables are deseparated on the graph, they are going to be conditionally independent in the underlying joint distribution. So the causal model of a DAG, on the other hand, is defined over a set of counterfactual random variables. And um, for example, the, we can write down the joint, uh, the, the, the counterfactual distribution after intervening on the random variable uh, uh, and, and after intervening on the treatment is going to be written as a product of uh, conditional densities of each variable given the parents uh, by excluding the treatment uh, from the product and evaluating the expression at the, at the values little t. So this is very similar to uh, the factorization of a DAG in general, uh, but as I said, we are dropping the, the, the conditional density that corresponds to the treatment variable. So in that sense, we can view it as inverse weighting or a truncated factorization, basically, where we divide the joint distribution by the conditional density of the treatment given parents, which is sometimes referred to as the propensity score. And uh, in DAX, the target, the counterfactual means is always going to be identified uh, by a G computation. And we can always uh, easily find a sufficient adjustment set by just looking at the parents of the treatment, which basically blocks all the backdoor uh, uh, path into the treatment. And we can have this nice adjustment functional where we are adjusting uh, basically for, for, for parents of the treatment. And as I said, there are various ways of estimating this adjustment functional, but if the DAG is complete, meaning that uh, they, um, every two pairs are basically adjacent, uh, there is no conditional uh, independencies uh, or, or marginal independencies between variables, then the augmented IPW is going to attain the semi parametric efficiency bound. But if you have a sparser graph, we can exploit uh, these constraints uh, between variables to gain some uh, efficiency. And also finding, uh, we, we can have multiple uh, valid adjustment sets in a DAG, and there are very cool results on uh, finding optimal adjustment sets, basically, in both in linear settings and in non-parametric settings. So working with DAGs in general is uh, very nice, but uh, a more realistic setting is where we have unmeasured confounders. The presence of unmeasured confounders is going to make our lives much harder. Um, for example, here, if we have this unmeasured confounder that I'm denoting by H and colored in red, uh, I've also sometimes referred to as hidden variable or latent variable, uh, then the effect of the treatment on outcome is no longer going to be identified. Um, but if, for example, we think that we have measured a variable that mediates all the, the effect of the treatment on outcome and doesn't have uh, an unmeasured cause, then the effect is going to be identified, uh, but not through adjustment functional, through a more, uh, uh, through a different uh, types of functional that is referred to as front door uh, adjustment or front door functional. And this graph here is uh, called the front door model. 
Um, but maybe this graph also doesn't uh, represent uh, our, our, our beliefs about um, how the variables are related. Uh, we can construct more complicated graphs. This is a slightly more complicated graph where we have multiple mediators and different patterns of uh, unmeasured confounding. Um, and we, we want to we want to know the same um, we want to answer the same question of whether the effect is going to be identified or not. So working with um, DACs with hidden variables or latent DACs is um, a little bit inconvenient for um, both computational reasons and uh, statistical reasons because they uh, and they have uh, sometimes singularities and it's preferred to work with a summary of uh, DACs with hidden variables called the acyclic directed mixed graphs or ADMGs for short, where um, they're called mixed graphs because uh, we have a mix of edges, directed edges, and bidirected uh, edges. And there are a certain uh, rules called the laden projection rules that was uh, introduced by uh, Verma and Pearl uh, on how to construct the ADMG from the original DAG with hidden variable. But um, I'm not going to go over it to save some time, but for the purpose of this talk, you can think of the bidirected uh, arrows basically as a hidden variable that is pointing to the variables at the endpoints. So we are, we are asking the same question, given this, uh, given an arbitrarily ADMG, can we identify uh, the counterfactual mean using uh, the function of observed data, uh, as a function of observed data, basically. Um, and there are very nice sound and complete algorithms that answer this question for us completely. Uh, it's sound in the sense that uh, when uh, it thinks that the effect is identified, it's going to spit out a functional uh, that is a correct uh, functional for identification of, uh, of, the, of the target. And if it says that the effect is not identified, it means that it's provably not identified and no other algorithm is going to be able to identify this without making further assumptions. Um, so these, these algorithms are pretty cool, but uh, unfortunately they are underused to owing mostly to the complexity of the functionals that they uh, output. Uh, for example, using uh, the algorithm that is described in uh, Richardson and Company's paper, we can write down the counterfactual mean in this graph as a function of uh, observed data via this functional which is basically a function of the, we are using the outcome regression, the conditional densities for both mediators and the treatment. Uh, and if I want to estimate this functional, I need to, and I want to use, for example, plugin, I need to specify a lot of pieces in the likelihood. I need to almost know the entire likelihood to be able to, uh, to, to estimate this quantity. And so now the question is, are there alternative ways of estimating uh, the, the identified target? So to reiterate our objective, we want to find various estimation strategies for the identifiable target, the counterfactual mean, in causal models where there exists no valid adjustment set and the front door functional is no longer going to be valid. Also. Uh, so let's look at the uh, factorization of the joint distribution in, in ADMGs. Um, it turns out that these bi-directed connected components on the graph are uh, very important uh, pieces in trying to uh, factorize the joint distribution. They're called districts and uh, we're denoting the set of all districts in, in the graph as calligraphy D. And they partition the set of vertices on the graph in uh, distinct sets basically. Um, so Tian and Pearl in 2002 showed that we can write down the joint distribution in an ADMG as a product over these uh, conditional factors of um, each district given a parent of the district. Uh, so this is resembles again uh, the DAC factorization quite a lot, but here we are using this Q notation uh, to, to uh, emphasize that these are not ordinary conditional densities. Uh, they're called kernel factors or kernels for short, sure, uh, which have some nice statistical interpretation and causal interpretation. Uh, for a, a kernel that corresponds to the district D, the statistical interpretation is that they are basically a map, they provide a mapping from parents of the district to normalize densities over the variables in the district D. So in that sense, we can uh, use um, or with typical probabilistic operation that we do like conditioning, marginalization, base ruling, etc. Uh, on these kernels. So the causal interpretation of these kernels is that they correspond to a post-interventional distribution where everything outside of the district is intervened on. So how do we write down these kernels as ordinary conditional uh, densities? 
So one way to do it is uh, through what we call Markov polo of a vertex or a variable. Uh, and, and it's defined as follows. So Markov polo of vertex VI is a district of the vertex along with the parents of the district uh, in a subgraph where we are looking at variables that precedes VI according to a topological, a valid topological order. Uh, by a valid topological order, I mean uh, a set of uh, an ordering on a set of uh, on, on the vertices where no variable later in the order appears uh, to be an ancestor of a variable earlier in the order. So given these Markov polos, we can write down the conditional, uh, the, we can write down the, this uh, conditional factor corresponding to the district D as a product of conditional, regular conditional densities of each, vari each variable in the district given Markov polo of the variable. And if I just substitute this uh, definition into the district factorization, I get what we call the topological factorization of ADMG, which is basically a product over conditional densities of each variable given Markov polo of the variable on the graph. Um, so similar to DAGs on how um, it encoded the, the, the DAG factorization encoded uh, um, a set of conditional independences statements, uh, this topological factorization also um, encodes assumptions of a similar form where we say that a variable is independent of uh, the variables that precedes, uh, precedes, it in, precedes it in the topological uh, um, order, uh, excluding the Markov polo of uh, that variable condition on the fact that we know what the Markov polo of the variable is. Um, so there are more assumptions that are encoded uh, in an ADMG that are uh, given by the nested Markov model of an ADMG. Uh, but in this talk, I'm not gonna go over uh, describing that uh, because a lot of what they discuss is, uh, is a lot of what I discuss is related to the topological factors of an ADMG basically. So this is a quick example. Uh, what are uh, the districts uh, in this uh, ADMG? We have uh, three districts, the set C by itself, and the T and L together form a district because they are bidirectly connected, and M and Y also together form a district because they are bidirectly connected. So the district factorization is, um, is going to be a product uh, of three terms, each uh, um, district given their parents, and if I want to write this down as a function of uh, P of V, basically, uh, I pick a, top, a valid topological order, which is uh, there exists only one single valid topological order in this graph. Uh, the one that uh, says that C precedes T, T precedes M, M precedes L, and L precedes Y. And based on this topological order, the, the, each, each of these kernels basically are going to be written in terms of uh, ordinary conditional densities in this form. Uh, so now I want to dive into the main results in the paper. Uh, so he, uh, we, to discuss the results, uh, we are dividing basically the class of all ADMGs into uh, two different uh, subclasses. One, uh, depending on how the treatment is related to basically its children. So the separation criterion looks at uh, the district of the treatment and the children of the treatment. And if the district and the children uh, don't intersect, then we're going to say that the effect is always going to be identified. And to refer to this class, we call the treatment to be primal fixable. So in a primal fixable, in, a, in an ADMG where treatment is primal fixable, we're going to propose several estimators, like the primal IPW estimator, dual IPW estimator, and derive the efficient IF in the non-parametric uh, uh, non model, and uh, show that the estimator that we can get out of it is doubly robust. Um, and um, uh, yeah, and, and this, this class of primal fixability is very interesting um, because it has a lot of um, interesting uh, cases as, as it's uh, special cases, like the backdoor adjustment, the front door adjustment. Uh, and also I'm gonna briefly talk about uh, adjustment fixability where, where, we only, where we say that the, uh, not only the district and the children uh, don't intersect, but the, also that the district and the descendant, descendant of the treatment also intersect at the treatment itself and nothing else. So on the right-hand side, if uh, the treatment is not primal fixable, uh, or in other words, if the district of the treatment and the children uh, have some uh, intersection, then the effect may not be identified. Uh, 
when, but when it is identified, uh, we also propose uh, some estimates that we call the nested IPW estimator and uh, propose some estimation strategies that sometimes are partially robust to model misspecification. And we rewrite the original ID algorithm, the, the, the sound and complete ID algorithm, so that it uh, outputs basically uh, the, the nested functional as, uh, as it's identified functional when the effect is identified, so that we can have uh, basically like um, different ways of looking at uh, the effect that is identified, uh, which will be useful in, in from uh, estimation point of view. And uh, the, for, um, my talk is mostly focused on primal flexibility. I'm just going to talk about uh, efficiency um, results also a little bit. Uh, so let's uh, um, describe uh, what primal flexibility means uh, one more time. Uh, primal flexibility says that the treatment uh, shouldn't have any bidirected paths to any of its children. So this bidirected path uh, basically formed from the district. So it's like the district uh, of the treatment and the children of the treatment shouldn't uh, basically intersect. Um, so if you think about it, uh, there are a lot of uh, interesting special cases. Like for example, in DAGs, we, uh, each district, the, the district of each variable is the variable itself. Uh, so it's not gonna, the, the treatment, for example, in a DAG is not gonna have any uh, intersection uh, with, with the children. So in some sense, the, uh, looking at DAGs, especially looking at uh, a, special, a special case of ATMGs where treatment is primal fixable. Uh, so Frondo is, uh, again, a special case of this, uh, um, this uh, 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 subclass, and uh, this is uh, another example where treatment is going to be um, primal fixable. Why? Because looking at the district of the treatment, you see that this is only contains T and L because they are bidirectly connected, and the children of T is just M, so these two sets uh, have no intersection, uh, so therefore the treatment is primal fixable. Uh, so primal fixability is also uh, nice because it coincides with uh, what Tian and Pearl showed in 2002, that the post-intervention distribution P of V of T, where we intervene on the treatment and we are interested in the, the effect of the treatment on all the other variables on the graph, is going to be identified when the treatment is uh, primal fixable. In other words, primal fixability provides a sufficient and necessary condition for the identification of this post-intervention distribution. Uh, so when, it's, uh, when the treatment is primal fixable, this is going to be identified like so. We take the joint distribution and we divide it by what looks like the propensity square um, of some conditional density of the treatment given its Markov blanket where the Markov blanket is defined as the district of the, district of the treatment uh, along with the parents of the district. Uh, but this is obtained from a kernel where everything outside of the district of the treatment uh, is intervened on. So how does this relate to the district factorization? So we can take P of V and expand it using the district factorization. Uh, remember, it was a product over uh, all the districts in, on the graph. So the first two terms correspond to uh, the district of the treatment itself, and the rest are basically uh, a product over uh, the rest of the districts on the graph. And uh, what we are doing by dividing by this quantity is basically getting rid of the first term here. So in some sense, uh, it relates to the truncated factorization when I was talking about it in the, uh, uh, in the conditional ignorable model or, or in DAX in general. So we are interested in the counterfactual mean by doing some uh, rearrangement and uh, marginalization. Uh, we get that the counterfactual mean is identified in this form. Uh, but we want to see how this relates to the topological factorization. We want to replace these cues with the ordinary conditional densities. To do that, uh, I'm just going to describe, uh, 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 just introduce um, a, a new notation to avoid um, cluttering the notation. So here we fixed a topological order and we partition the set of all vertices into three distinct sets. The first one is C, which contains all the pre-treatment variables. The second one is the set L which contains all post-treatment variables and uh, the variables that are in the district of T. And the set M is basically everything else. Uh, in other words, your post-treatment variables that are not in district of T. Uh, so given this partitioning, we can write down uh, the, the target, the counterfactual mean as the functional observed data in this form. So here, the outer expectation is taken with respect to the pre-treatment 
pre-treatment variables. And we have a product over uh, conditional densities of variables that are in the set M. These products are evaluated at T equals to little t. And we have a product over conditional densities of variables that appear in the set L. So if I want to um, estimate this, uh, like use the plugin and the MLE principles, so I'll try to parameterize each of these conditional densities by eta, and I get the estimate of the parameters and evaluate the expectation empirically. And uh, this, this, this is the estimator that I'm going to get. Uh, but it's going to be consistent and symptotically normal under some regularity conditions and positivity assumptions in a model where all of these conditional pieces are basically correctly specified which is a lot to ask, right? Uh, so uh, the question is, uh, are there alternative ways of estimating this identified functional? And the answer is yes. Uh, we show that under prime of flexibility, we can estimate this counterfactual mean by estimating this functional that we call the primal functional. We are basically looking at the treatment, the rows that uh, agree with the treatment assignments and reweigh them by this ratio that involves conditional densities of the variables in the set L. Uh, so remember the set L are post-treatment variables that are in the district of T. Um, so intuitively, this representation corresponds to um, what we are familiar with in the IPW uh, sense when we are dividing by the propensity of the treatment. But again, this is uh, not the, the regular propensity score, it's a then quote unquote nested propensity score that can be obtained from uh, a post interventional distribution where we intervene on everything outside of the treatment. And if I uh, write down uh, what this uh, term is in terms of the topological factorization and do some algebra, I basically uh, get uh, this prime, get to this prime of. Uh, representation. So the estimator that I get out of this representation, we call the uh, primal IPW, and is going to be consistent under, uh, under uh, the assumption that all the conditional densities uh, of each vertex given the Markov pillow, basically, where the vertex is in the set L, are correctly specified. All right. So this is um, uh, still quite an this is, this is quite an improvement to what we had before, where we needed to uh, specify everything in the set L and M together. But here uh, we only need, require a specification of uh, the, the, the pieces in the set L. Uh, just a quick example: uh, what does primal IPW looks like for this graph? Uh, it uh, again it involves um, conditional densities in the district of the treatment, uh, which is T and L. So we have a term for P of T given C and P of L given T, M, and C. Uh, and in order to estimate this, we uh, parameterize them, estimate the parameters, and empirically evaluate the expectation. Um, so, so, so we saw that we can use the set M and L together for, for the MLE, and uh, we can use the, uh, the conditional density in the set L for the primal IPW. So now the, um, a, a, an interesting question is, uh, can we use this conditional uh, densities for, ver uh, for variables that are in the set M to construct an estimator now? And again, the answer is yes, we can do that. We show that under primal flexibility, we can estimate uh, this uh, counterfactual mean by estimating this functional that we call the dual representation or the dual formulation, um, which uh, again, is it's a product over some ratios where ratios are involved in uh, where conditional uh, densities of each variable given Markov polo for variables in the set M are involved basically. The numerator and the denominator are almost the same, except for the fact that in the numerator, we are evaluating everything as at t equals to little t. Uh, so again, this uh, estimator is going to be a consistent and synthetically normal in a model where all the uh, conditional densities of uh, the form vi given Markov flow of vi are correctly specified when vi on the set m. So I'm, I'm denoting it by ms star uh, to make a quick point that uh, sometimes you can simplify this representation a little bit. Um, and so when, when can we simplify this is when the treatment is going to be independent of the variable given the markup pull of the, 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 the variable. Uh, in, in those uh, cases, the treatment, we can uh, drop it past the conditioning bar so that the numerator will cancel out with the denominator. Uh, so in, in some sense for 
the dual uh, IPW to be consistent, uh, we sometimes we don't necessarily need the, the, the conditional densities in, uh, for, for the vertices in the entire set of M. It's just a subset of, subset of M. In the paper, we call this the inverse markup follow of the treatment. Uh, so just uh, um, for an example, what is the dual IPW here? Uh, it, again, it involves the vertices, the, the conditional densities in the set M. The set M are post-treatment variables that are not in the strict of T. So here it corresponds to the mediator M and the outcome Y. So this is what the dual representation looks like. And we can simplify this a little bit uh, and replace the, uh, the, the distribution of uh, the outcome Y with the outcome regression. And again, parameterize them, estimate the parameter, and empirically evaluate the expectation. Okay. Uh, so the dual IPW in general has a very uh, neat uh, graphical interpretation. Uh, so what we are doing by dividing, um, the, uh, so what we are doing dividing the joint distribution by these uh, um, two uh, conditional uh, distributions and remultiplying them by the same conditional distributions, but uh, when we are what we are evaluating those pieces at the treatment equals to little t. So this operation corresponds to basically the treatment splitting operation where uh, the random variable, uh, the random part of the treatment gets all the incoming edges and all the y direction heads to it. And the fixed part basically you know, gets all the outgoing edges. And again, the variables that are down the stream of the treatment will turn into counterfactuals. So here's a comparison of the primal IPW and the dual IPW side by side for this specific example. And color coded here, you can see that primal IPW and dual IPW are always going to need to use uh, different pieces of uh, the topological factorization. And so because I started by partitioning the, the entire set of vertices into three distinct subsets, it's easy to see that, yeah, the primal and dual IPW use variational independent pieces. Uh, but uh, when we arrived at this conclusion at the, at the beginning, it was very uh, amazing to us that we can always come up with two variationally independent estimators for a, a big, a large class of ADMGs when the treatment is primal fixable. Uh, so Rohit was very keen on how to combine these two estimators and get uh, a doubly robust estimator in the same way that we can think of sometimes augmented IPW as combining like the propensity score and the outcome regression model. So we looked into deriving uh, the influence function in the non-parametric model. And this is uh, what it looks like. Uh, we, we drive it using the pass by derivative of the identified functional uh, when the treatment is primal fixable. And uh, this is um, nice in the sense that it's gonna automate a derivation of influence function for us whenever the treatment is primal fixable. We can mechanically apply this, uh, this theorem here to get to get the IF, the influence function. Um, so, it, it, it looks a little bit messy, but intuitively what it's what, what the representation looks like is that uh, each fact each each variable that uh, each conditional uh, density of the variable that appears in the identified functional is going to have a representation in the influence function in this form uh, where we have a weight term uh, that is a function of everything that precedes vi and a centered term that is a function of everything that precedes vi and vi itself and the weights are interesting because depending on where the variable uh, sits in what sets, uh, the, the weights are going to look like either uh, the ones that we saw in the primal IPW or the ones that we saw in dual IPW. And the estimators that we get uh, from this by solving the estimating equation with the influence function, we call the augmented primal IPW. And the augmented primal IPW is going to be doubly robust in character specification of either uh, of these two sets, uh, either the conditional densities of the variables uh, that are in the set M or the conditional density of the variable that are in the set L. And the estimator, uh, uh, this, this estimator going to attain the semi primary efficiency bound for the union model at the intersection submodel where everything is correctly specified. So the statement of double robust, robust, robustness is conservative, again, uh, in, because we can sometimes have uh, simplifications of the, the graph itself the, uh, or the influence function itself to, uh, to kind of gain some um, sort of uh, freedom in a specification of uh, pieces. Uh, so just for the sake of completeness, what is, this is what uh, the uh, uh, influence function looks like for this graph that I've been using as an example. And uh, as you can see, the primal IPW and the dual IPW are gonna directly show up in the, in the IF. 
I'm just gonna pause for a question before I go into a special subclass of primal fixability. Uh, yeah, we have no unanswered questions right now, so maybe you can continue. Okay, okay yeah. great. Um, uh, so, um, so and now we are looking at, uh, we wanted to look at a special class of primal fixability that we call adjustment fixability, which, uh, uh, so what is adjustment fixability is basically says that uh, not only there is no bi-directed path between the treatment to its, any of its children, but there is no bi-directed path to any of its descendant. So mathematically, uh, what we mean is that the district of the treatment doesn't, uh, the district of the treatment uh, intersects with the descendant of the treatment only at the viable uh, treatment itself. Uh, it's just because the because how uh, the descendants are defined, uh, which include the treatment itself. Um, so this, so this uh, adjustment fixability uh, coincides with what fixability, with how fixability is defined in the uh, nested Markov uh, paper by Richardson and company. And we, we, call, we, we gave it the name adjustment fixability because of uh, this result where we say that when treatment is adjustment fixable, the, 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 the counterfactual mean, the target is going to be identified via the adjustment functional with having the Markov pullout of the treatment as, an, as, an, as, as a valid adjustment set. So this is uh, quite interesting because uh, what it means is just like we can look at uh, arbitrarily ADMGs when we have um, different patterns of uh, unmeasured confounding. Uh, but if we realize that the treatment is, is adjustment fixable, we can uh, simply use uh, adjustment functional to, to estimate the target or just like use uh, the results, uh, the other results that are related to how to estimate a, 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 an adjustment functional basically. Uh, so some of the, um, so our, our results uh, uh, simplify uh, when we had uh, the treatment to be primal fixable, uh, for example, the influence function will simplify to this uh, representation, which is familiar to us. Uh, this is what uh, the influence function looks like for uh, the condition and ignorable model when we are working with the augmented IPW. And, and as you guessed, it, the augmented IPW represent, uh, estimated, estimated for this uh, identified function is going to be doubly robust and correct specification of uh, either the propensity score or the outcome regression. Um, so this, this is a quick example uh, of uh, how to use the adjustment fixability. Here, the treatment is going to be adjustment fixable. Why? Because uh, the district of the treatment is only Z1 and T because they are bidirectly connected. And the descendant of T are T, M, Y, D1 and D2. So the intersection of these two sets is just uh, the treatment T. So therefore, the treatment is adjustment fixable. So what it means that I can uh, now uh, use Markov pullout of the treatment as a valid adjustment set. So I pick a topological order, a valid topological order like this, and identify what the Markov pullout of the treatment is, is which is uh, this, the set C and the set Z. And uh, I can immediately use uh, some nice estimators like the augmented IFW in order to estimate this quantity basically by relying on uh, uh, the models for uh, the, the conditional density of the treatment given the set Z and C and Z and the outcome regression given uh, the set C and Z. So yeah, if, if uh, I didn't know that this is uh, adjustment fixable and this the, the results simplify quite a lot, uh, if and I was looking at the output of the uh, identification uh, algorithm, this is what it would uh, uh, give me. And uh, this is a little annoying to work with uh, because it requires a specification of, of uh, different more pieces basically. All right. So I'm just now going to talk about efficiency a little bit. Um, we have proposed uh, several types of estimators, and uh, we want to know uh, are these estimators going to basically uh, achieve the semi-parametric efficiency bound or not. Um, to answer these type of questions, we need to understand the type of restrictions that are implied by the nested markup model of an ADMG, which are uh, called the equality constraints. And there are uh, two types of equality constraints that we can have. One of them is called the regular conditional independences, which is like to say X independent of Y given set Z. And the other ones are what called the generalized conditional independences, also known as Wehrmacht constraints. I'm just gonna explain what Wehrmacht constraint is via this example here. Uh, looking at this ADMG, if I use the separation, I can see that the treatment T and the outcome Y 
uh, are not gonna be independent. There is no separation set basically between the treatment and the outcome. So in this graph, the treatment is depends on the outcome Y. But if I divide this, uh, if I intervene on the variable L, or in other words, if I divide the joint distribution by uh, the conditional density of L given T and M, I obtain a post-intervention distribution where the treatment is going to be independent of the outcome Y. So this is what's called a verma constraint. Uh, so you can think of verma constraints as basically regular conditional independences, but in a post-interventional distribution. So working with uh, ADMGs in general to reason about efficiency is difficult because absence of an edge in an ADMG, unlike DAGs, may or may not correspond to a quality constraint. So for example, this graph here, uh, there is no, uh, this, the variable Z and the variable Y are not adjacent, but this doesn't correspond to any equality constraint basically. Um, so what, what we did was uh, coming up with this algorithm uh, that checks the non-parametric saturation of an arbitrarily ADMG. It doesn't have, the treatment doesn't have to be prima fixable. Uh, it works for uh, any ADMG and uh, and regardless of what the query is, uh, we, we might not be interested in just the uh, counterfactual mean, we might be interested in other causal targets, but we are still, for the efficiency reasons, we wanna know whether the, whether the, the, uh, the, the model basically entails any equality constraints. Uh, so intuitively what it, what it does is that it uh, constructs um, an equivalent, uh, another, another equivalent uh, ADMG that is nested Markov equivalent to the original one in the sense that it preserves all the equality constraints in the original graph. Uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the graph is called uh, the maximal arid, uh, maximal arid projected and the, the, the operation is called the maximal eye projection to get to that graph. And we showed that this is uh, the, the, the obtained uh, projected graph is actually maximal in the sense that if two vertices are not adjacent, uh, the, 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 it, then it corresponds to some sort of equality constraints, either regular or uh, verma constraints. So the algorithm is, is sound and complete in what sense? In the sense that if it returns that the ADMG model is, uh, the, the, the nested Markov model of the ADMG is not parametric saturated if there is no equality constraints. And if it, re, it returns not uh, NPS, it means that there does exist at least one equality constraint. Uh, so if, uh, why is it important? Because if we know that uh, the model is NPS, then uh, we know that in, in, in the primal fixable uh, case, uh, the IF that we derive and the estimator that we, uh, that we obtain from it is gonna attain the uh, uh, semi parametric efficiency bound. But otherwise there are constraints that we can uh, exploit in order to gain some efficiency. But working with REMA constraints is particularly difficult and uh, I haven't come across uh, work that takes advantage of these types of constraints in driving what the, uh, what, uh, the, 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 the tangent space of the model will look like. Uh, and I would be interested in, in hearing about it if there are any work, uh, but we didn't give up there. So we tried to come up with a class of ADMGs where there, where there is no verma constraints basically in them. There's no generalized condi uh, uh, conditional independencies. Uh, we call this class of ADMGs MB-shielded ADMGs, uh, which says that uh, an ADMG is going to be MB-shielded if uh, two vertices that are, are not adjacent, it is the case that neither of them in it are in uh, one another's Markov uh, blanket basically. And the set of assumptions that uh, an MB-shielded ADMG um, encodes are uh, of this familiar form that given the markup uh, pull of a variable, the variable is going to be too independent of uh, the, the, the variables that precedes it uh, in the topological order, excluding the markup pull set itself. Uh, so for example, uh, this graph here, uh, if you pass it through uh, the algorithm I showed in the previous slide, you know that this is not NPS. And if we check uh, for every two vertices that are not adjacent, whether they are in each other's Markov blanket or not, uh, we realize that that's not the case. And uh, so this is an example of MB shielded ADMG where we can be sure to say that there is no very much constraints basically in this graph. There's no generalized conditional independence in this graph. Uh, so because the, the assumptions of uh, Markov shielded, uh, Markov blanket shielded ADMG look like, uh, are, are DAG-like, we can 
come up, we, we can construct the tangent space uh, relatively easy and uh, do the projections basically of uh, the influence function that we have uh, so that we can gain, gain some efficiency basically in, in a model that is not NPS. And this is what uh, the projection looks like for the influence function when the treatment is uh, in a prime of fixable. Uh, just the last example, uh, what about situations where the treatment is not prime or fixable? So here, uh, the, 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 the district of the treatment is T, R2, Z, and R1, because they are all bidirectly connected. And R1 is also a, a child of the treatment. So then uh, the, inter the intersection is going to contain R1, so therefore the treatment is not going to be prime or fixable here. Um, but uh, if we use uh, the idea algorithms from uh, the, the works that I showed, uh, we, we can uh, be certain that the effect is indeed identified in this graph. Uh, so what, what we did uh, was try to come up with uh, some, some sort of estimators uh, that are different than what uh, the original idea algorithm basically uh, outputs for, for the identified function of. And here the estimator that we can get out of this representation we call the nested IPW, and it's only gonna rely on a specification of um, conditional densities of variables in the district of the treatment only and, and nothing else. So basically looking at this graph, I can come up with an estimator that uses only the models for R1, ZT, and R2 to construct the estimator. Sometimes this representation is uh, better, but sometimes uh, there might, they might not be uh, much gain, but it's also good to have like different uh, representations of the same uh, functional from an estimation point of view. So just to conclude, uh, our contributions are multifold. Uh, one is related to uh, model characterization, where we have uh, we propose a sound and complete algorithm to determine the non-parametric saturation status of the models, and we propose a class of ADMGs called the MB-shielded ADMGs, where there is no generalized conditional independence system. And uh, as far as the estimation goes, when the treatment is prime fixable, uh, we propose a primal dual and augmented primal IW that uh, uses different uh, bits of uh, the top topological factorization and looked at the adjustment fixability as a special case of primal fixability when we can use the Markov protocol of the treatment as a valid adjustment set and uh, looked at some uh, efficient estimators basically when treatment is primal fixable or adjustment fixable in MB shielded APMGs. And uh, um, for, for uh, the classes of ADMGs when treatment is not prime or fixable, uh, we, the effect, as I said, the effect may not be identified, but if it is identified, uh, we propose the nested type W estimator that uses uh, the models for in the district of uh, the treatment basically to construct the estimator. And uh, a lot of what I discuss here is implemented in a package called Ananke. It's a Python package for causal inference using the language of graphical models. And uh, besides uh, estimation, there are also uh, other nice components to it from uh, non parametric identification, and surrogate experiments, and, and other things. Some links to the documentation and the repository. And the main contributors of this package are Rohit Bhattacharya and, and Jaren Lee. And this is a quick example of uh, what it looks like. You can specify uh, your, uh, your, your, you can, you can draw your assumptions about uh, the data generating process, basically in terms of a graph, uh, with uh, specify where the unmatched confounders are, and specify you, you might be interested in the effect of a treatment on an outcome like CD4 counts in the CD4 counts in an HIV study, and uh, the, uh, the, uh, the the implementations in the package gonna tell you whether the effect is going to be non parametrically identified or not. And if it is identified, it's going to uh, evaluate the, uh, the graph a little bit, uh, check whether it's not primary exaggerated, whether it's MB shielded or not, and based on those, uh, try to propose several uh, estimators for it and calculate the effect, basically, depending on what estimator you want to use. And with that, I open the floor to questions. Uh, great. Uh, thank you, Razi, for the very nice talk. I think, uh, yeah, for time reasons, we should now switch over to the discussion. And then, yeah, if there's some questions left, we can uh, we can take them at the end. So yeah, let's uh, now uh, give the stage to Eric. Um, and then after that, Razi, you will have the opportunity to respond. Uh, Eric, whenever you're ready. All right. Thank you so much, um, uh, Razi, for a beautiful talk and thank you to the organizers for the invitation to discuss this, this work. Um, this was a hard paper for me to read arguably because I'm, I'm not really a graphical 
person, um, but I am friends with good um, researchers in graphical causal effects um, type of research. And so I uh, contacted one of them who happens to be a co-author here, Ilya, and who was very helpful in transcribing um, some of the, the uh, most difficult aspect of this paper. And I, I really, really enjoyed the paper, particularly after he explained it to me. Um, and the paper sort of builds on this large literature on identification of causal effects in hidden variable graphical models. Um, initially, people were interested in, in, in directed the cyclic graphs um, in settings where there are no hidden variables and the causal effects are identified. Identification formula in, in such settings is typically given by the so-called G formula, also known as the backdoor adjustment. Um, and there are lots of papers written on this basis as, as Razi mentioned. Um, the, the construction of, of such estimators really hinges on the Markov factorization of the DAG, which is the product of conditional densities of children given their parents. And these, these factors are uh, incredibly important to construct W uh, robust estimators. Um, and the operation goes by taking that factor, that Markov factorization and truncating all relevant factors for the treatment variables we're intervening on, um, then averaging over the remaining variables when appropriate. Um, now, the, the situation can be considerably more complicated if there are hidden variables or unmeasured confounders. Um, and, and rather than displaying them in a DAG, um, people have um, had this clever idea of using an acyclic directed mixed graph, ADMG. And, and as Resi described, this is a latent projection of an equivalent class of many uh, hidden variable DAGs. And it's, it's an equivalent class in the sense that all hidden variable DAGs that agree with the AGMG on all equality constraints, and therefore they also agree on identification theory. And identification AGMG is, is hard, uh, but fortunately some clever people in causality. And, and in fact, it's been completely solved by the so-called Tian's algorithm which leverages an alternative form of factorization, which Razi referred to as a di district factorization in terms of kernels uh, of the joint distribution. Um, and Spitzer and, and Perl proved that in fact, Tian's algorithm is complete in the sense that if it tells you that something is not identified, you can um, be, you can be um, uh, reassured that it's not, nothing can identify it without an additional assumption. And, and Spitzer and, and colleagues propose a one-line algorithm, uh, which is sound and complete. <clears throat> now, what is this paper really about in this, in this, in this context? Um, the, the paper, one of the, the, the basic contribution of the paper, which I really, really like this, is this, this um, to propose three forms of identification in a ADMG that, that, they that they consider. One is so-called adjustment fixability, and I view this as essentially a fancy backdoor adjustment for much, much more complicated graph than the canonical uh, three node graph. Um, and and it offers a generalization of, of the backdoor adjustment formula to the setting of ADMGs. Um, second one is, is primal um, dual fixability and which is a generalization, uh, as far as I could tell, a generalization of the front door adjustment of, of Perl. Um, to the context of ATMGs, and I will refer to this as a fancy front, front door, which can deal with considerably harder problems than the traditional um, front door DAG. And, and we saw the power of it in, in Razi's presentation. And then there are the third kind, which is, doesn't belong in either of the first two. Uh, it's everything else that is identified by Tian's algorithm, as far as I can tell, and not in the other two buckets. I think this is an incredibly useful taxonomy of identification for various reasons. Um, first, uh, there, there are very few people in the world who can appreciate both semi-parametric theory and graphical models. And I'm not one of those people, but I do recognize uh, that Razi is one such person and her colleagues, and they unleash the power of, of semi-parametric theory to characterize W robust estimate functions as she refers to them as influence functions for all ADMGs for which fancy backdoor adjustment all fancy front door adjustment identifies the causal effect. And it really blows my mind. This is a really important and powerful result. 
Um, there are a lot of special cases to this result, like um, Robbins, Rudnitsky, Zhao, nearly 30 years ago, uh, had a similar result for backdoor adjustment in DAGs. And the, so this kind of generalizes to a much broader classes of problems where on measure confounding might be operating. And it also generalizes uh, a, a, recently, a recent paper of ours um, where we propose an, an, an W robust estimate equation for the classical front door, or if you want the non-fancy front door adjustment functional. Um, and, and so that, that I was very pleased to see, to see that that could be generalized to much more complicated um, situations where the, the ID algorithm actually shows that there is identification of a causal effect. And then there's a third uh, last contribution where they obtain somewhat weaker result for nested, nested fixability. Um, where it's it sometimes identified, sometimes unidentified. Um, in fact, they obtain what they refer to as a partial double robustness property. I'm not gonna get into. So in closing, um, I, I wanna make sure that Razi has some time to answer these questions. I have a, a series of questions um, that I would like to, to ask the speaker. Um, the taxonomy includes functionals arising from Tian Perl Spitzer's identification algorithm, and therefore precludes other useful um, generic forms of identification, for instance, the IV graph, which technically the ID algorithm would tell you you're not identified. And that's because you're not identified everywhere. You identify when you have uh, information about, when you have um, the, the exposure is, the IV is relevant for the exposure, but also you typically need an additional fourth assumption aside for the ones included in the graph or proximal inference graph, where again, you have to um, you, you have this sort of generic forms of identification where you're not identified everywhere in the model, but sometimes identified as special, some special, uh, in some important cases uh, of the graph. And so Mike, one, the first question is, can, can there be a characterization of IFs that could be extended to these forms of, of ATMGs where you, you can get um, generic uh, identification despite the fact that uh, the IG algorithm might suggest that it's not, the causal effect is not identified. Um, the, the taxonomy focuses on total effects and, and begs the question as to whether um, path specific effects, mediation analysis is a very popular uh, field of causality these days. Um, and so my question to, to Razi is, should I anticipate a second installment of, of this body of work to deal with such causal queries based on the ID result of, 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 of Ilias and, and, and colleagues uh, in the context of path specific effects? The third question, um, while one might have a W robust uh, influence function, um, th that does not necessarily imply that one can construct a W robust estimator. And this, this Razi alluded to this, uh, in, in some cases, it was unclear whether it was special cases or if it's always true for uh, some classes in her taxonomy that the nuisance parameters are always guaranteed to be variational independent. Certainly in the nested factorization models, um, these do not appear to naturally be variational independent. And so is there a general scheme to construct uh, such a parameterization, reparameterize the model in such a way that you can actually make use of this, the fact that the influence function does enjoy a double robust property to actually construct um, uh, an estimator that instantiates that double robustness empirically. And then um, before my last question, I have actually, I, I, I snuck in one more question. And so um, Resi, you are gonna have to remember this one. I, I don't have it on the slide, we, which is Ilya a while back years ago had, had uh, this conjecture that in, 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 in these graphical models um, that one could think of a, of a graphical criterion for double robustness. And, and at the time his, he, his, his, his conjecture, which I don't think he's proved yet, but probably uh, you have discussed this with, with him and your colleagues, is that as long as you always get one district for free. And so, and my question to you is, have you, have you seen counterexample of that? Do you believe the conjecture? Have you proved the, the conjecture? And so this would be really an important contribution to the field as to developing a, 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 a graphical uh, criteria for double robustness, I think would be a very useful tool to have. And then finally, uh, the paper assumes the ADMG is correct. And I, I know everyone who looks at this, and, and this is often the criticism about graphical models is you assume you're an oracle who knows the graph and somehow you have identification. And, <clears throat> and now it's, you know, it, it, the, the, most people like to think about triangulation in causal inference. I, I might look at different 
uh, sets of assumptions and try to identify the causal effect. And this might correspond to different AGMG under which I could identify the causal effect and construct an influence function under the identifying functional. And so a, a more robust approach might consider a union of models, if you will. So this is not uh, double robustness in terms of model specification, but rather double in, in terms of, of statistical model specification, but rather in terms of graphical model specification. And so you have a union of, of, of such ADMGs. Um, have you, might, might one be able to, to um, identify a, a causal effect? An example is given here, suppose I have, I can show that I have an indication if either a fancy front door criteria holds or a fancy back door criteria hold adjusting for C or adjusting for Z, uh, a mediator, um, without necessarily knowing ex ante, which is correct. That would in fact be a really powerful tool. So I, in fact, reading this paper, really got me interested in this question. And I have a partial answer that in fact, you can find such estimators, but it requires an additional assumption. Uh, it appears that the answer is negative without an additional assumption. Um, and and the, the, the intuition is actually quite, quite e easy to fulfill. It would have to be that the influence function that you have has a dual representation that it, it is in fact polymorphic, that it could appear to be an influence function for the front door and appear to be an influence function of the back door. And it turns out that to find such objects, you need a rich enough set of influence functions. And so your model cannot be a saturated model in either cases. But once you, you have an unsaturated model, you, you can obtain such estimators. And I think this is actually a really, really promising route uh, uh, of research, um, just because we, we now have amassed many identification results that are useful in practice and people have candidate variables that allow you to attain identification in those settings. And so the natural next question is how do we combine them? And I will stop there and, and uh, listen to Razi's response. Thank you so much again for this opportunity. Thank you so much, uh, Eric. It's always uh, very nice to, to hear your insightful comments. Um, so uh, for, let me see if I remember the order of the question. So the first question was about uh, what parts of our results basically can be used in order to derive estimators for situations where the effect is not necessarily non parametrically identified, but is going to be identified through some other uh, means by making some, for example, parametric assumptions in, uh, in, in the IV uh, sense. Um, so I think um, w one thing that I can th think of right now is that uh, the algorithm that we propose for uh, finding the non-parametric saturation status of a uh, of a of a, of, a, of a, an arbitrarily ADMG uh, would, be, would be useful in in addition to what kind of parametric or semi-parametric assumptions you have on the joint distribution, in the sense that you want to still to be able to. I, to, to write down what the list of assumptions, the equality constraints are basically that are implied by the model, uh, regardless of whether the effect is going to be identified or not, because you're gonna guarantee that maybe somehow after to, by making extra extra assumptions. So in that sense, I think, um, yeah, one, one quick um, result that can be used in, in those settings is just like be able to, yeah, see, to be able to basically characterize the non-parametric saturation uh, in some sense. Uh, for the second question, whether uh, we are extending it to other types of uh, uh, causal quantities, uh, the answer is uh, yes. Uh, so besides the past statistic effect, one uh, potential extension of uh, the work that uh, Rohit and I are interested in is just like looking at like longitudinal settings, for example, because as I mentioned, this is just like looking at the single treatment and a single outcome. Uh, but uh, also, yeah, of course, we are also thinking of the past specific effects. Uh, uh, in fact, with uh, uh, you yourself also involved, Eric, and uh, I'll, I'll be um, sharing more results on that end. So for the past statistical effects, again, we also uh, I'm looking at like a um, in in a setting where the effect the the past statistical effect is going to be identified uh, as a function of uh, the topological factorization, uh, um, where we basically can write down the effect in the, in, in terms of different pieces of the topological factorization by like by evaluating the different pieces at different levels of the treatment depending on what pathway we are interested in and. And uh, yeah, I mean, just a quick um, a quick plug on what like, what kind of robustness we can get. Maybe that also could be possible that we are extending uh, the results uh, that you and Ilya had about uh, the triple robustness of direct and indirect effects to triple robustness of uh, arbitrarily passive effects. 
for the third question, um, so the, yeah, so in terms of like variational independent pieces, uh, so we are uh, so our claim is that when the treatment is primal fixable in uh, an arbitrarily ADMG, um, it's it's always the case that we have uh, variational independent. Mm, mm, it's always the case that there are nuisances in the influence functions are going to be variationally independent, and the two estimators that are uh, that we can get out of this uh, IF basically the primal and IPW are always going to be variationally independent, but that's not necessarily the case anymore when the treatment is not primal fixable, uh, and and we called it in the origin in the uh, original draft of the paper nested fixability. Uh, in, in we we didn't. Uh, drive the influence function in for, for that class. Uh, it's complicated for exact uh, same reasons that you pointed out about like, uh, that the uh, pieces are going to be variational and independent in the identified functional that we, that we get. And that, that just like uh, thinking through this requires more, more, more time basically. Uh, but yeah, the claim is that as long as you have primal fixability, you're gonna, our nuisance is gonna be um, variational and independent. Um, so which kind of relates to your uh, last question of whether we can have uh, a graphical characterization of when we can have double robustness testimeter. Um, so, um, yeah, I mean, the nice thing about this estimator is in the primal fixability is that you're just gonna, it's very clear on what sort of variables you are, uh, your, what, what sort of variables are going to be used in the uh, in, in the estimation uh, step. Like you're using uh, districts of T or you're using things outside of the district of T. And it is uh, it is guaranteed that you're gonna have a doubled robustness uh, estimate, a robustness that it, an estimator that is doubled robust in a specification of either of these two uh, sets of models. And whether it's a general situation or not, I mm, want to make a bold claim of uh, yes, that might be, but it requires, uh, yeah, again, again, of course, requires proving it. But it's the reason I'm mm, lenient to say that it's, uh, I'm, I'm leaning towards saying that it's uh, possible is that. Uh, the, the nested IPW that we propose also is going to use uh, the models in the district of the treatment. And that's 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 a good start because maybe by more thinking we can come up with estimator that uses uh, things outside of the district of the treatment to identify, uh, to, to estimate the effect when it's uh, nested fixable. Um, or, or it could be the case that we need to break some sort of uh, independencies between uh, the, the the variables on the graph in order to get to uh, uh, to to, uh, the, to a CAD mag or a post interventional graph where um, yeah where 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 we where we can construct to estimate that you, that uh, require um, two distinct sets of models related to the district of T or things outside of the district of T. Um, but yeah, it's um, it's still uh, something that uh, is open and uh, requires more thinking, of course. Uh, but in terms of also just combining um, the back, the fancy back door plus the fancy front door uh, uh, scenarios, I think uh, it's quite interesting, and I would love to hear uh, your thoughts uh, more on this. Uh, what I, yeah, I mean, one one quick uh, comment is that uh, there are also so the, the adjustment fixability. Well, we used it as a special case uh, of primal fixability. So, but it is the case that uh, when treatment is not primal fixable, we can still have uh, scenarios where the ADMG is uh, where the effect in the ADMG is going to be identified through adjustment functional. Uh, but we don't uh, right now have a nice characterization of what uh, those ADMGs would look like. Like a simple uh, example is when we have the M graph with like T to Y and M bidirected T and bidirected Y and like a bunch of confounders pointing to T and Y. So here we don't have to adjust for C and then we know that the treatment is not primal fixable because there is a bidirected path to uh, to the direct uh, child of the treatment, but adjustment fixable is valid, right? Uh, so just maybe characterizing a larger class of uh, fancy backdoor adjustment will be also like add more to uh, your conjecture of combining these two uh, basically sets. I think that that's all I have to say for now. <laughs> Thank you so much.
I think you answered all my questions. <laughs> <laughs> all right, thank you. I think it's now time to uh, time to wrap up. So let me quickly share the next screen. So first of all, thank you so much, Razi, for a very nice talk, and uh, also Eric for a great discussion. Uh, thank you also for Rohit for helping out the, in Q and A. Um, next time, we're going to have uh, Niklas Pfister from the University uh, of Copenhagen talk about statistical testing under distributional shifts. Um, until then, I hope you have a great week. Uh, thank you all for coming and uh, see you next time. Thank you so much. Bye.